Hi, ever since NVIDIA released information on their new Tensor cores within their new Volta architecture, I have been interested in how they were possibly implemented. I thought it might be interesting to share some of those ideas, hence this video. I want to start off by preferencing that I am not an NVIDIA employee and I don't actually own any of the Volta hardware. Most of this video will be speculation from a VLSI architecture perspective. So, what is a Tensor Core? It's a specialized function unit within the Volta architecture, which performs matrix-matrix multiplication and addition. Here is a diagram demonstrating the operation, where a tensor core takes the inputs A, B, and C, and produces the output D. Ordinarily, for scalar numbers, i.e. non-matrices, this would be a simple fused multiply add. However, things become a bit more complicated when dealing with matrix multiplication. For those of you who may have forgotten, matrix matrix multiplication is done via row by column multiplication and summation. So the expression to compute the first element in D, D00, would be this, where this computation is done for all 16 elements of D simultaneously. Immediately by looking at the expanded expression, a few things should stand out. One, how the operation relates to a floating point multiply accumulate, two, that it will require 16 simultaneous data paths, or in other words, 16 pieces of duplicate hardware for each tensor core, and three, that this operation probably can't be done within a single clock cycle. There are a few things that I feel that I should mention from a high performance computing and applied mathematics perspective. This type of operation shows up almost everywhere in applied mathematics problems, from computational geometry and computer graphics, to neural networks, to numerically solving differential equations. So the inclusion of a hardware component in the Volta architecture which performs this operation is very helpful to high performance computing problems. Another point is the inclusion of the accumulation step, i.e. the C matrix above. This addition allows for partial products of larger matrices to be computed. While the hardware is limited to 4x4 matrices, computational problems will often have significantly larger matrices, think 1024 in one dimension for a small matrix, which can then be decomposed into 4x4 chunks and summed via partial products to produce the original operation. To better visualize what exactly the tensor core is doing, here is an animation from NVIDIA. The left is the older Pascal architecture, where each element within the matrix had to be computed individually, and on the right, the Volta architecture, completing the entire operation in one go. Keep in mind here that one of the green 4x4 squares on the bottom is a completed matrix-matrix multiplication. You can see the point that NVIDIA is making here, that the new tensor cores are able to compute 12 matrix-matrix multiplications in the time that a Pascal streaming multiprocessor requires to compute one. There are two interesting points to make note of, however. The first is that NVIDIA is claiming 12 times the throughput, which is not a multiple of 16, but a multiple of 4. So given that each row or column of a Pascal 4x4 matrix can be completed in one macro operation, the claim is that the time to complete 4 Pascal macro operations is equivalent to the time to compute 12 Volta tensor core operations. Each Pascal macro operation requires four operations within it, so this suggests that either NVIDIA is taking into account clock frequency, or that the Pascal operations are more efficient than a single tensor core operation, which is exactly what one would expect. The second thing to take note of is the fact that NVIDIA uses the word throughput and not faster. To understand this a little better, let's look at the functional block diagram for a tensor core. Once again, this is a diagram from one of NVIDIA's blogs, which shows how a small slice of the computation is done. Note that this is computing a single fused multiply add. Also note here that there are three inputs to the adder, one from the multiplication, one from the F32 input, or matrix C in the previous slide, and one from additional products. The first thing to note here is that binary arithmetic, which is what the floating point adder is doing, can only be done pairwise. This means that essentially these three additions need to be made up of two smaller additions, or they have to use a more complicated piece of hardware called a compressor. The next thing to note is that floating point addition is complicated because of denormalization and renormalization steps required. Luckily, the floating point numbers do not need to be denormalized before going into the multiplier, but they do need to be realigned afterwards and after every addition. And finally, notice that the output and addition is a 32-bit floating point number, but the two inputs to the multiplication are 16-bit floating point numbers. 
This is most likely due to the reason mentioned in a previous video that multiplication of two 32-bit numbers would result in a maximum of a 64-bit result, and similarly, two 16-bit numbers result in a 32-bit result. A small footnote here is that a 16-bit floating point number does not actually occupy 16 bits for the mantissa. However, the concept still applies. For a brief overview of GPU architecture, the block diagram on the screen is a processor block, also known as a partition. There are four processor blocks within a single streaming multiprocessor, or SM. Each processor block is capable of executing its own instructions. However, the processor block is only capable of issuing a single instruction to the entire block. This is done via the warp and dispatch units. Note that this is an implementation of single instruction multiple data, or SIMD. So you can, for example, multiply two 16-element arrays together in a single instruction by using all 16 floating point 32 units, or FP32. Note that all of these units are executing the same instruction, where a single thread is scheduled on a single FP32 unit. Further note that because of this architecture, branching instructions at the thread level are inefficient. And a final note is that FP32 units are what NVIDIA calls CUDA cores, where there are 16 per processor block, which cannot execute individual instructions. Looking at the block diagram of one of the four processor blocks within a single Volta SM, we can see that there are two tensor cores, and that they are massive. Each tensor core is divided into a series of 64 blocks spread out in a 4x16 grid. Most likely, the vertical axis of 16 blocks represents the resultant matrix elements, which since we are dealing with a 4x4 matrices, that totals 16. Then horizontally, we have the four fused multiply add units. The next thing to consider are the stated latencies and throughput. According to the Volta Architecture white paper, one of the FP32 fused multiply add units has a latency of 4 clock cycles, while the Pascal units had a latency of 6 cycles. Additionally, one academic paper cited the white paper claiming that the tensor cores have a throughput of 1 operation per cycle. However, I was unable to find that claim in the actual white paper documentation. It's possible that it was removed or cited incorrectly. Either way, a throughput of 1 per cycle should be possible if done correctly. I should also note that while it's possible to make use of the main FP32 FMA units for these tensor core operations, it's unlikely that they are helping, since the required signal routing between the two sides would be a nightmare. So essentially, this is what the block diagram of one of the elements of a tensor core should look like. To allow for a throughput of one per clock cycle, we will need to add some pipeline registers, however. This will effectively allow for a latency of four operations and a throughput of one operation per cycle. Hopefully the individual blocks in the previous slide are more apparent. Furthermore, we can see that each of the tensor core blocks here are identical fused multiply add blocks, which themselves are most likely pipelined. The next problem to consider is how to supply the input data to the tensor core inputs. Most likely these units are implemented with reservation or hold registers on the inputs, each with their own write enable signal. It's also possible that the later stages contain delay registers, which are effectively like a FIFO, to allow for a single tensor core operation to be issued in one go. However, this may be unlikely due to the register port configuration of the processor block, which is currently unknown by the public. Essentially, using delay registers like this would require a 1536-bit data bus, or more likely 2048 bits, since the register file is 32 bits in size. Note that this is in comparison to the ability to execute 16 simultaneous instructions to the floating point 32 FMA units, which would only require 1024 bits. On the other hand, if a single FMA operation in one of the TC blocks is pipelined and takes 4 cycles, then you have 4 cycles to update the TC registers, which could make use of a smaller bus, being 512 bits in size for example, though this would reduce the throughput to 1 every 4 cycles, which is not the original claim. Regardless, this is all speculation from a hardware design perspective. So what would one of these FMA units look like? Here is an implementation of a cascade multiply add block presented in a 2016 paper. On the right you can see the functional units minus the pipeline registers, and on the left you can see the pipeline stages. I'm not going to go into the details of how these work, but the takeaway is that they are not simple. Also note that the implementation shown here was for 32-bit single precision. So let's look at the pipeline stages in order. Here we have two multiplication stages, followed by two adder stages, followed by a rounding stage. 
For those of you who are not familiar with this type of pipeline pictorial diagram, we are looking at micro instructions. In this case, since a tensor core operation consists of four micro instructions on the y axis and time on the x axis. Each block represents a clock cycle. Now, since this is for 32 bit and the tensor cores use 16 bit multiplication, we can remove one of the multiplication stages but must keep the two add stages. The multiplication does not rely on the addition, so we can start the next operation during the second addition stage. Since we are chaining the CMA blocks together, we actually don't need to do the rounding stage, since we can simply realign the addition path which is already done in the add zero stage. Doing so, we end up with something like this. Here, only the final result needs to be rounded, which saves an additional cycle. In principle, we could then stack the operations like this. As you can see, this implementation does allow for a throughput of one tensor core operation per cycle. Here is the quick identification of the units used. Notice that after the first cycle, the second tensor core instruction issues a multiplication on the zeroth CMA unit, while the first tensor core instruction is still using CMA0. This is allowed due to the pipelining of the CMA units. So here is what a fully saturated pipeline would look like. I color coded the individual tensor core operations, where each contains a solid colored circle to denote when the data for that specific CMA unit needs to be available, and an outline circle to represent when the result is available. In this entire diagram, we only have two full vertical pipelines, which can be seen here. Notice that we have four register file reads and one register file write for that single cycle, where each register file read is reading two 16-bit values and one 32-bit value, and every write is a 32-bit value. Alternatively, all of the values can be written to delay registers before the first multiplication cycle for each operation, which if we do that, then only the green dot on the bottom is written. But that's four values to write, and the orange circle at the top is still red. This only shifts which data is being written each cycle and not how much is written. To further illustrate that point of throughput, here is the second vertical set in the following cycle, which you can see also requires four reads and one write. The takeaway here is that if the data access problem can be solved, then it should be possible for a single tensor core operation to complete every cycle. Also keep in mind that what is being shown here is the result for one of the 16 tensor core elements. To end the video, I figured I should make a few notes regarding an FPGA implementation of the tensor core since that's what my channel has been focused on. The main point is that this is a very complicated design to implement in an FPGA, especially since the CMA units themselves are complex. As such, any implementation is going to result in massive resource utilization, where each tensor core would probably be well above 50,000 logic elements, so you might be able to fit at most three within the largest Cyclone 5e device. From previous optimizations, however, we can immediately tell that in terms of performance, the slowest part is going to be the multipliers. However, since the multipliers of the Cyclone 5e can operate at 200 MHz, that will probably be the frequency cap of an implementation. Note that 200 MHz is within the same order of magnitude of the Volta tensor cores, so you could achieve performance close to the actual NVIDIA silicon in a higher-end FPGA like an ARIA-10. There is still the bandwidth problem to solve, where you can't route all of the connections needed to feed the tensor core every cycle. So while in theory an FPGA tensor core implementation could have a throughput of one operation per cycle, it would be impossible to feed data into and out of such a component given the routing constraints of an FPGA. And so all those points combined leave me with that it's probably not worth attempting to build an FPGA based tensor core. Hopefully you found this analysis of this new piece of hardware interesting. Thanks for watching.